episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, once again to another episode of our show, bringing you another truly fascinating guest today, uh, helping to create a better tomorrow uh, for mo many of us. Uh, we are the honor today of being joined by Dr. Maria Elena Batazzi, who is Distinguished Professor of Biology, Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, and Professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Molecular Virology and Microbiology, Integrative Molecular and Biomedical Sciences and Translational Biology and Molecular Medicine, all at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Botazzi is also co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development, adjunct professor in the Department of Bioengineering at Rice University, and editor-in-chief of Current Tropical Medicine Reports. Uh, Dr. Batazzi has her undergraduate degree in microbiology from National University uh, of Honduras, her PhD uh, from University of Florida, did her postdoc fellowship here in Philadelphia at University of Pennsylvania and at University of Miami, uh, as well as a fellowship uh, from the American Association for the Advancement of Science Leshner Leadership Institute. Uh, and she is involved in a range of activities related both to the development of novel vaccines and adjuvants for so-called neglected tropical diseases, including Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, uh, human hookworm, uh, as well as doing extensive work uh, in the area of COVID. Uh, so all that being said, Dr. Batazzi, wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you very much, Ira. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm sorry about the mouthful of all the titles that I have, but uh, it may sound complicated and cumbersome, but I think it's just very joyful to be able to work in so many disciplines academically, but also to be able to um, bring forth solutions for many of these uh, infectious, neglected, you know, diseases that I know um, are going to be, you know, one of the topics that we'll have a conversation today. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a very impressive, it's a very impressive list of titles, I just have to say off the top. But uh, thank you so much for being with us. You know, I'd love to start off as we, we typically do, uh, just by handing our guests the floor for a, a few minutes, just to ask the basic question, uh, when and why did microbiology become a passion of yours? Well, you know, I uh, grew up in Honduras. So, um, you know, as you know, Honduras is uh, a small country in context of many countries in the Latin American uh, uh, hemisphere. Uh, and in fact, in the Americas, um, and we have a lot of poverty. That's a reality and unfortunately still is. And so growing up, I was uh, even inadvertently, if you want to say this, or, you know, or, you know, my surroundings were clearly, um, uh, you know, a lot of poverty uh, scenery that I had. Um, and, and it always was uh, very curious for me to understand why, you know, what are some of these factors or some of the things that really predispose someone to continuing this cycle of poverty. And of course, there's many reasons, right? Um, whether it's economic, whether it's social, whether it's just, you know, the access to, you know, be able to get a job, you know, but I think a lot of it also stems with um, the type of health uh, these populations have. And if you live with a constant, um, uh, you know, health um, uh, disability, uh, even though they may not necessarily sometimes be very apparent, you know, it really has a burden on how you eventually become a productive member of society. And so since very early on, I realized that health was important. Uh, so my fascination with, you know, eventually science and microbes, because most of um, what we see in, in, in countries like Honduras, uh, and now certainly a lot of uh, what we call non-communicable diseases like diabetes and other things like we've seen in even high income economies, you know, clearly a lot of the, of the health burdens are really coming from uh, infectious diseases. And, you know, transitioning from that to the topic of, of tropical diseases, uh, you know, obviously we, we look at our globe and, and we look at the tropical region of, of our planet and, and add in the subtropics there. We're talking about uh, dozens of, of countries, um, billions of people living there. And obviously most, uh, of the audience obviously has heard of things like malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, of course, uh, less so uh, human hookworms, schistomysiasis, leishmaniasis, 
But the numbers, uh, just pulling some from your website, are, are very shocking. Um, 700 million suffering from hookworm disease in the world today. Uh, schistomasiasis, uh, 200 million, killing an estimated 300,000 annually. A lot of poor countries. Um, talk a little bit about just the general area of neglected tropical diseases, if you would, and sort of what is the scope of activity currently in 2021? Is it mainly vaccines? Is it the repurposing of existing drugs? Is it novel drug development? What's the area look like in general? Well, thank you for that question because I think it's very important and you're right. I mean, many of these that we call, you know, in aggregate neglected tropical diseases are probably diseases that many of you who are listening have never heard before. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're neglected, because they're not uh, quite uh, highly advertised, as we hear, of course, you know, malaria, HIV, or tuberculosis, like you mentioned, or others like we now hear, right, Zika, sure. or even, you know, other type of, you know, certainly now with COVID, right, with the coronaviruses. And, and, and again, it's, it's a neglect, mostly not necessarily because we don't have a lot of people being affected. It's, in fact, it's a lot of people, but they're poor people. So, you know, you have to then recognize that maybe they don't have a, vo a, you know, a, a voice that really can highlight the importance. Another major distinction is that indeed, uh, even though they may uh, be quite prevalent, they are not uh, big killer diseases. And, and, and in our society, I think, you know, we human beings, of course, are always trying to look for ways to avoid mortality, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, but we, we pay a little less attention to uh, improving uh, the health, right? And that, again, going back to, again, to preventive medicine, right? Mm -hmm. To prevent diseases when the diseases really don't kill someone, but they can really have long-term effects. And in fact, we're actually starting to hear about this now, even in the context of COVID, right? Sure. You know, so there's a big problem, of course, with the deaths that COVID has caused. We don't, but, but I think what's gonna really be something that we have to start paying attention is all the people that are gonna have the long COVID that they're, you know, they clearly can survive, but that they will survive with burdens of disease or sequelae that really eventually will burden, the, again, the health status of an individual and eventually, you know, we're already hearing, right, that they cannot go to work or that they already have some other type of disability. So I think that's the problem with these so-called neglected tropical diseases. And even though we call them tropical, mm -hmm. and of course it does give this impression that of course, uh, you know, are found only in areas of the tropics or like with you know, typical jungle, right? It's really not true, right? In fact, even in the, um, in the United States, sure. we have a lot of these tropical diseases and not necessarily because of migration or movement globalization of people or even, you know, animals. It's actually because, you know, with everything, you know, superimposing also climate change, you know, um, you know these not only diseases, um, um, the microbes themselves, or even the vectors that carry those microbes change. And so now, in fact, we don't only find these diseases in only the tropical setting. So then when, when you ask me, you know, what are we doing? So true, you know, ideally is to raise awareness. So I appreciate very much the opportunity of being here with you and talking a little bit about these neglected diseases. The fact that I want to highlight that don't only think that they only occur over there and not here, right? Because indeed now they're starting to occur um, even in high income country settings in the poor areas of the high income countries. In fact, most of them, believe it or not, are found in pockets of poverty of high income economies, mm. um, which is very interesting if you really uh, think of it. Um, but then also the fact that what we need to do is also come up with integrated approaches to control them, right? Sure. So again, the best that we could ever do is prevent them, prevent from these diseases to occur. And that's where it comes into play, hygiene, good, good infrastructure, good sanitation, of course, access to water, access to, of course, good nutrition, access to healthcare. Uh, but also, of course, and vaccines, of course, are also preventive measures, if you mm -hmm. want to count them. But then we also have to integrate them that if for some reason, indeed, you know, we cannot 
prevent, you know, you also have methods where you can either treat them um, and, you know, certainly cure them. Sure. And, but all of that in the, in, the, in the backdrop of, you need to also be able to diagnose them and detect yeah. them. So I think that's where really my fascination came when I was uh, studying these microbes. It was not only the question, what do these microbes do and, and what kind of disease they cause and where are they found, you know, and how are they transmitted, you know, and all that, but also how I can come up with tools, which I call technologies or global health technologies to detect them and detect them well um, and detect them in different settings, right? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I have to use uh, types of detection methods in re low resource settings or in the field, which are not the same when I go to a laboratory in a high income country in a hospital, for example. Um, and then I would like to make sure that I integrate their, you know, development of vaccines, which is of course to try to prevent them, sometimes even vaccines to cure them. Um, and of course, then maybe have uh, compat com uh, compatible technologies or even complementary technologies, which are treatments, but in the in the in in in, in an integrated fashion where I raise awareness, I educate, I also say, you know, in addition to all these tools, you know, like we hear again also for COVID, you know, keep good hygiene, keep good distance, sure. you know, keep, have a good infrastructure, you know, so again, everything around this, um, you know, uh, prevention of these infectious diseases usually are integrated approaches. And, and speaking of integrated, because I, you know, I spent time going into PubMed and, and I think everyone should should go in and put Dr. Patazzi's name into PubMed because it is a truly integrated uh, uh, set of publications and, and, and approaches that you've been involved in. And, and, the, and I'd like to start off uh, with, with probably the most re the recent paper in PubMed uh, entitled Identification of Vaccine Targets and Pathogens and the Design of Vaccines Using Computational Approaches. Uh, and, and here, uh, this is Nature Scientific Reports, you go into uh, some of the sort of the technologies that we've spoken about on the show recently in terms of the, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. Uh, and then you have a term, immunoinformatics, which is a very interesting term. And really, I think it speaks to, uh, especially the last couple of years, we've learned hearing so much about the immune system, not just the adaptive, but the innate immune system, very complex combinatorial space. Uh, talk a little bit about this paper, if you would, and, and some of these in, interesting sort of next generation tools you're using to study uh, vaccines. Yes, absolutely. And I think I have to say that in my last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I think one of the most fascinating things that I end up doing now is uh, working with people that are actually not microbiologists and scientists, <laughs> right? You know, in fact, I work with business uh, engineers, I work with law, you know, with the legal uh, framework, the ethics, and then, as you said, you know, the computer tech, you know, uh, savvies. And I am probably the least qualified to speak fully about that article because, in fact, it was a collaboration with a team of computer informaticists, right, you know, uh, uh, that you know want to use big uh, algorithms of data mining and what what you, what basically is what we now are seeing more and more uh, in in our social media uh, um, frenzy, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's just you know computers that you know um, utilize data to then create algorithm algorithm algorithms. I'm sorry okay. to predict things, right? Like the sure. same way how you get probably an email or, you know, when you're searching in the, in, in, in Facebook or Google or whatnot, that, you know, you, if you start searching some product, then you get a slur of, of uh, advertisement on that product. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, so we use the same, right? We basically say, okay, we have this organism, this organism contains all, you know, this genetic code and therefore mm -hmm. it, it has all sorts of proteins. Some proteins are essential for that pathogen because they carry calcium or because they use it to infect cells or because they bind to receptors, right? Similar to how we're doing also with the COVID virus, right? We're sure. looking at what are the interactions of the molecules within the pathogen with the host, mm -hmm. because eventually there has to be, again, that's why they're called parasites because they find ways to kind of live within the different hosts. Mm -hmm. And then we look to see where do we have these networks 
of, of proteins and, and uh, interactions that can, can give us hints of how we can then destroy such pathogens, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the way that we then now are crafting this uh, new ways of doing vaccine development, right? Mm -hmm. Where we, we synthetically design vaccines on the basis of not necessarily even working with the pathogen directly, we basically just work with the pathogen on the basis of its genetic code, which is then from a DNA, it's transcribed uh, into an RNA, and then it's translated into a protein. And that's where the magic of these RNA vaccines came about, mm -hmm. right? Now, there's always people who are going to have to still study the pathogen in real life because, sure. you know, these algorithms and these computer-based predictions you eventually have to test them to see if, if indeed predict the right thing. But now we can start with at least narrowing the field. And basically it's the same way how we now know that, you know, targeting the spike protein of COVID is the, is the ideal target for a vaccine or targeting, you know, certain aspects of the virus when you do these drug designs. Um, or in fact, you know, how can you detect um, pathogens by, specifically looking at um, some sort of detection methods, right? So I think it, you know, we're seeing more and more the use of computers, the use of big data, you know, mathematics, because it's all mathematics, right? Sure. You know, if, in fact, if you look at the real behind the scenes of how that nature uh, reports came about, it's all mathematical formulas, which ask me and I honestly have absolutely no clue what they mean, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we, cool. right? But we, the scientists and we, those who understand the pathogen, provide the, 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 the I guess, the informaticists, the assumptions. It's the mm -hmm. same when we work, for example, uh, we work very closely with health economics. Uh, okay. and, and the econo economists, also, it's all mathematical modeling, right? You know, so the cost of illness or, the, or, or how much an intervention will cost or how much will an intervention reduce uh, the, the burden of, you know, of a pathogen. Mm -hmm. All is based on the assumptions you plug into the system and that system then, you know, a kind of, you know, um, spits out, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, an algorithm. And mm -hmm. then you just have to try it out in real life. And that's why in vaccine development is not only so important to do, you know, some of these empirical um, uh, and, 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 and calculations, but then you have to go through the, you know, clinical trials, and then eventually you go into real world evidence, right? Mm -hmm. So clinical trials are not even just by themselves sufficient you still have to then apply into real world evidence. So it's all interconnected. But as you know, now with, you know, so many advances in technology, it's just, it's mind blowing, right? Mm -hmm. What we can do today compared to what we used to do even 20 years ago, when yeah. I was studying in University of Florida, or even when I was at Penn, you know, we used to do things a little bit more, you know, manually. Now everything is practically almost automated, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and speaking of um, some of those new technologies, uh, we, we hear a lot about obviously things like uh, messenger RNA vaccines, as you were just mentioning. Um, what we hear maybe a little less about, which you're equally in, involved in, is adjuvant development. Um, uh, several years ago, I was working at a, um, a plant, a company that was uh, doing phytochemistry, and I, I, I was introduced to the QS21, which was this really cool plant extract, comes from this tree, I think in Bolivia or Peru or something. And I was always amazed, like, wow, this soapy type substance from a tree in Peru increases how my vaccine works, which is pretty cool. Talk a little bit about your work in adjuvants and, and, and the principle of vaccine sparing. Yes, sure. And maybe let me actually put it a little bit in context, right? Because sure. by no means uh, technologies are a bad thing, but technologies, like with everything, when it's new, yeah. um, it brings um, a lot of challenges, right? You know, challenges in scaling them up, challenges mm -hmm. in the fact that they're probably more expensive at the beginning. Uh, especially the fact that people have to be trained to be able to advance technologies. So when we, in our vaccine center specifically, design our vaccine prototypes, we, even though we love innovation, and we hope that at one point those innovative technologies, such as RNA vaccines, will be reachable uh, in, in, even in low-middle-income low country settings. And we're seeing now, in fact, with COVID, 
how that's been such a challenge. You know, we had, we, I think one of the mistakes that we saw during the pandemic is that we sort of forgot a little bit to rely on conventional technologies. Mm -hmm. And within conventional technologies, we have the so-called recombinant protein-based vaccines, sure. which, you know, are very well known. We have probably even more than 50 years of, you know, knowing how to make them. Um, example, you know, hepatitis B vaccine is a recombinant protein-based vaccine. The help human papillomavirus is a recombinant protein-based vaccine. We have, you know, we know how much they cost to make. They're very cheap. We have a whole ecosystem of production factories around the world. And we have a lot of people who actually have the know-how, right? But those recombinant protein-based vaccines by themselves as proteins need a little help. And this is where these adjuvants come into play, right? Um, and they're just a part of what we call formulation science or, the, mm -hmm. or pretty much the, the vaccine science of protein-based technologies where you couple the protein, which is in itself uh, focusing the immune response uh, to, 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 to a, a specific target, right? Like, let's say, you know, we took the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, we made it into a protein, and that focuses the response to be able to prepare us against, you know, a coronavirus in this case. But at the same time, we needed to make sure that our immune response is balanced, uh, robust enough, that maybe even allows us to retain memory, right? Yep. And, you know, that it's durable, yep. right? And, and, and the protein alone wouldn't be able to do that. And so that's where we play around with these so-called adjuvants. And adjuvants are really immunostimulants, right? Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like um, a little um, pitsy dust of, you know, add-on that you add to the, to the vaccine mm -hmm. formulation, right? And what it does is we want a balanced response. So you have some stimulants that can say, okay, if, if, for example, our vaccine for COVID right now is a protein on an aluminum formulation backbone, and then we add an immunostimulant, which is a deoxynucleotide. So the protein targets the response very specifically against coronavirus. The aluminum shifts the, the immunogenicity into what we call a Th2, so antibodies, and certain cytokines that are activated, you know, in the in this line of of, of what we call helper, T helper uh, uh, um, side. But then we add this, the deoxynucleotide that says, I don't want it too Th2 or too antibody mediated. I also want T cells and I want other things. And so it balances it out. And so that's why in this case, it's kind of like a trio, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a protein on, a, on an al aluminum and then with an immunostimulant. Um, and that seems to be a, a winning combination. And, and the same happens with many other you know, vaccines. Mm -hmm. Most of our vaccines, in fact, most vaccines that are approved in the United States um, have as a backbone this aluminum base. And then you know, now we're starting to see other immunostimulants to come into play. And they're very unique because they're actually also synthetic. They, they're made in the laboratory. They're actually small molecules, to be quite honest. They're actually considered pharmaceutical uh, um, little uh, molecules. They're very small. They're made, you know, in, in, it's, a, it's in chemistry. So it's a mm -hmm. chemical entity, but they're very powerful. And what, why are they powerful? Because, you know, this comes again from our cellular biology, you know, everything in our body responds to signals, right? Sure. So these small little molecules trigger signals inside our cells. And again, mm -hmm. tells a cell, you know, cell A, make this cytokine, cell B, make this other cytokine. So it's by triggering um, these receptors that we have in all our cells around our different, you know, immunological uh, organs. Very cool. Um, continuing along that path, um, an another fascinating paper of yours uh, just from a couple months ago, uh, mining the metabolome for new and innovative uh, Chagas disease treatments. And, and, and this paper is fascinating because you, you get into the, uh, what you term the metabolic determinants of, of the tissue tropism. So how uh, the, the Chagas in, in this particular case interacts with various tissues. Uh, and then you get into sort of some of the different uh, effects you see or the ways to sort of mitigate, I guess, some of the pathologies with certain supplements 
implementations and whatnot. And this is just, it, it sort of adds a whole other dimension because we talk about vaccines and drugs, but here it's almost sort of a, some nutritional component. But talk a little bit about what you learn here in studying the, the metabolome as you study uh, Chagas disease. Yes, absolutely. And this is a fascinating collaboration we have with Dr. Laura Isabel McCall, um, and she's uh, at Oklahoma uh, mm -hmm. University. Um, and the reason why we like working with her is, is because she, again, brings this uh, uh, additional dimension. So we've been talking a little bit about not only, you know, the pathogens, but also our bodies. And as you yep. know, our bodies are pretty much made up with, of course, our genes, and then our genes become proteins, and then we have all sorts of, you know, cells and tissues. But then we have, you know, our metabolites, right? So, you know, part of this what we call the omics, right? So we have yep. our genomic, our proteomic, our transcriptomic, our immunomic, you know, so you call it now, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the recent one, we even have the microbiome, right? You know, yep. all, the, all the bacteria that live in, you know, but, but we all live in a backbone of, of, of metabolites, right? That, you know, that are pretty much the nutrition in the same way how we are, we have our own nutrition and activate the physiology of, of our organs, the pathogens do the same, right? Um, so we, so with in Chagas, Chagas is a very complex disease. It's actually a um, intracellular parasite mm -hmm. that actually lives, believe it or not, unfortunately, in our cardiac cells primarily. Mm -hmm. Sometimes also uh, the pathogen lives in some of our gastrointestinal cells. Uh, it can live in many others, but for the most part, where it, it causes a lot of damage is in our in our heart and in in. Uh, and, and that's why eventually um, people who have Chagas disease, and if they progress, they end up having um, uh, cardiomyopathy, right? And they could even end up dying, um, exacerbated then by many other many things, right? Because most of us eventually, as we get older, we always have, you know, some sort of uh, cardiac health, uh, you know, that, that we have to be cautious, right? With, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the amount of cholesterol or, you know, um, certainly... Uh, you know, other things that predispose us, you know, to maintain good cardiac health. So this parasite actually accelerates because what it does is it causes a lot of fibrosis in the heart. Um, it causes a lot of inflammation in the heart. And then because it infects these cells, these cells then burst. And of course, you know, uh, um, pretty much uh, uh, kills the tissue of the heart, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where we then have ab abnormalities. But that is in context of all these Enzyme, enzymes within the heart. So what we were try, been trying to do with Laura is, um, is evaluate, can we identify a little signature where, you know, if someone uh, can measure a metabolite in blood, you know, like when you go to the lab and they get your blood drawn and they measure, you know, the amount of enzymes or the amount of, you know, uh, chemical, mm -hmm. clinical chemistries that you measure all the time. Is there something that can already tell you that you may be at risk of developing Chagas disease, knowing that a person is already infected, right? Because the, the, the difficulty with Chagas is that you can be infected, you can be infected and, and even not have even detectable parasite in your body, but we know that there's a subclinical constant, uh, you know, presence of that yep. parasite. And you really won't know until you really get sick at the point where you don't have any more the ability of being cured. But if we can measure some of these metabolites, they can at least tell you, oh, you know, it may be that the disease is progressing. So mm -hmm. I think this is the value of coming up with those, what we call correlates, right? You know, sure. if I see that your troponin enzyme goes up, is that a reflection that you're starting to get, you know, some disease, uh, um, right? And then interestingly, uh, our vaccine program for Chagas is actually very unique because it's, in fact, this is one of our programs where we're evaluating not only a recombinant protein-based vaccine as one of our strategies, but also an RNA vaccine as one of our okay. strategies. And, 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 and maybe we can even look at can we combine a, an RNA protein strategy? RNA, as we've seen with coronaviruses, are really good at doing certain things. Yep. And then by adding a protein-based vaccine, maybe we can actually um, uh, enhance the ability of 
keeping down this fibrosis or keeping down this inflammation that it's caused you know, by this parasite. And then evaluated by measuring any changes, right? Any changes in the metabolites, any changes of things that we can measure. So I think that's the, uh, um, the ultimate objective of, of our, our program within Chagas to, to develop yes. a, an immune therapy. Mm -hmm. We call it vaccine, but it's really an immune therapy that combining again, modulating the metabolites, modulating the fibrosis, modulating the, 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 the inflammation can eventually, uh, uh, even, even though the parasite may be there subclinically, can yep. we keep control of that disease so that it, that disease doesn't progress? Got it, got it. Um, Maria, one more, one more paper. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, don't worry, but um, one more that I, I really found fascinating, and this one goes back about a decade now, but I wanted to bring it up just to ask you a question. Um, in, I think, 2000. 11, um, you published a paper, it's called um, ACAP12, a novel factor XA anticoagulant peptide from the esophageal glands of adult cyclostoma canium, which is a type of hookworm that affects dogs and cats. And one of the things I found fascinating about this, I just want to ask you about, obviously, you know, uh, you've spoken to this, we have this, uh, especially when it comes to these parasites, this unique back and forth biologic warfare. And in this particular case, you know, they don't want the blood to clot. They make this unique peptide in their saliva and so forth. Um, within your program, so uh, along the way, do you run into like peptides like this, whether they're for coagulation, inflammation, suppressing the immune response that you might, okay, you're developing your vaccines over here, uh, but at the same time, think, wow, these may make for good anticoagulants, anti-inflammatories, uh, autoimmune disease drugs, and so forth. Uh, for other types of diseases. A any interesting programs that ever pop up from, from these types of findings? Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's in fact, hookworms are fascinating uh, animals because, yeah. uh, to be quite honest, you know, sometimes when you talk about these pathogens, most of them are microscopic. They live inside cells and you probably don't see them with your yeah. real eye, right? Hookworms, in fact, are, you know, they're not hu huge like other, you know, uh, worms, but they mm -hmm. are at least one centimeter long as, uh, uh, in size. So you can actually vi visualize them. And, in, and with a group, uh, one of our collaborators in Australia, Dr. Alex Lucas, in fact, we've, um, we have been working now for more than two decades understanding the, that, that hookworm and, and, and how does hookworms really um, li live and feed and, and, and how do they cause disease? And, mm -hmm. the, and the fascination of hookworms is, first of all, they're called hookworms because they hook in the intestinal mucosa okay. of your intestine. But then beyond hooking and then really getting inside your mucosa, and they have these very awful teeth, um, you know, that they can they they kind of get stuck. Their 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 food is blood, so they feed on blood, and yep. that's why these worms are so so terrible because they cause anemia. Because what they do is they they start eating blood from the host from us. And you would think, oh, a little one centimeter worm, how much blood can they feed? And believe it or not, you know, they're, you know, avid feeders and mm -hmm. you can practically lose all your iron intake by the fact that these, these worms basically continuously kind of like suck on your blood. Mm -hmm. and, and what they do is indeed what you just said, right? So for them to digest the blood meal, they have to have a very sophisticated blood digestion system, right? Like we digest food, not blood, you know, unless we're vampires, right? <laughs> but if we were to digest blood, we probably would have something similar. So they have a combination of proteases to degrade the hemoglobin into small pieces, uh, anticoagulants to make sure that the blood indeed doesn't coagulate inside them, their own intestine. Um, they have detoxification uh, uh, systems. They use these uh, uh, glutathione transferases to detoxify mm -hmm. because everything that you digest, the same way how we go to the bathroom, the worm has to go to the bathroom and, and secrete all the toxic. So with Dr. Lucas, in fact, we have, in fact, originally, we always look, can we interfere with some of these um, uh, essential 
uh, functions that the worm needs to then create prototype of vaccines. And in fact, our, our, our most advanced candidates for hookworm um, as vaccines are one is an aspartic protease that, you know, if we block that protease, we interfere the worm to uh, degrade the hemoglobin and therefore it cannot feed. And then we also have another candidate, which is against the detoxifying agent. So then we also prevent the worm to detoxify and then they basically get, you know, they toxic, you know, it's toxic sure. for them and they mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Dr. Lucas has now looked at can some of these molecules be used to um, evaluate Crohn's disease? Mm. You know, um, can you use some of these yep. uh, um, molecules, like you said, you know, to become anticoagulants? Or some of them are um, inhibitors of proteases. Um, so yes, so the answer is yes. Uh, uh, and in fact, another area that is very interesting going back to adjuvants is with another group with Dr. Sarah Lustigman, we work in another parasite. It's, it's uh, that it's, you no, know, it's still in the area of, you know, these uh, uh, big worms mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, there is one of these molecules, which is a structural molecule, which is, um, um, in fact, is also found in hookworm, is called the ASPs. Um, they can have adjuvant activity because they, you know, these worms also need to make sure they can evade the immune response when they migrate through our bodies and when they live in our intestine. You don't want anything to come and, and destroy them. So they are also immunomodulating. And some mm -hmm. of them actually are, um, modulating in a way where, for example, we have been doing studies with Dr. Lustigman of putting in a flu vaccine, a uh, ASP2 protein combined with the flu vaccine because that ASP2 protein can act as an adjuvant. Mm. Uh, and we did that, she did the same with, in fact, you know, uh, with a coronavirus candidate. Um, and we're now basically also looking to see how can you identify novel adjuvants that are really molecules coming from these parasitic worms? So a lot of applications, as you see, right? You know, I, you know they, they're bad for many things because they are bad, you know, mm -hmm. these, these worms, um, especially causing all these, you know, disabilities. But th like you said, they may be a wealth of um, interesting innovation, similar to how we look for um, drug targets in you know, the algae yep. or in the bacteria, right? Or even in the, in the soil, you know, saying we can use these parasites. Yeah, and no, I, I think it's such an important theme. You know, we talked about, you know, bacteriophages on the show. You, know, you mentioned the microbiome, but, you know, there, there are some, we have to keep in mind, even with everything that's going on out there the last couple of years, that there is, there are, there are some beneficial things here that we have to keep our eye on as well. So that it's important. And I'm glad that you, uh, you brought that up. Um, Speaking of coronavirus, and 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 uh, you know, as you know, a couple, a couple months ago, I had um, uh, John and Mazette, uh on the show from from the Global Virome Project and, and the Spillover Project, and you know, she presented these uh, kind of scary numbers in terms of how many viruses are out there and so forth. But uh, obviously, uh, of those millions or 1.6 million, I think she mentioned, you know, they fall into different classes and and, and different groups. Um, I, I know that. I think you've been involved in the past on on at least uh, proposing pan coronavirus type vaccines, and I guess pan vaccines can exist for all different types of classes. But uh, can you just talk a little bit about your vision for uh, this type of vaccine development, as opposed to I guess other forms that we typically do? Yes, absolutely. And so you know, w w there's globally always been an interest of universal or like you said, pan, yeah. you know, we even have uh, been thinking about, can you do pan helminth, right? Meaning pan of these intestinal parasites. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always been this interest on universal flu, right? Um, um, so you're right. And, and now with coronaviruses, knowing that we not only had, you know, two prior, you know, uh, outbreaks uh, now with this pandemic, you know, it's clear that, you know, there's a cycle and that these, these viruses most likely will continue to spill over from, you know, the animal kingdom to the humans, right? Because we all kind of like live together and we're at some level disrupting the ecosystems and therefore there's ways that they can look for, for other hosts, right? Um, I think that um, 
unfortunately, as you know, uh, many groups, including us, we, we have been advocating for sustainability in funding research to look at these types of questions. And, and true, some pathogens are much more difficult to look to find good interventions. Like, you know, we have years of trying to develop a HIV vaccine uh, when we now see that for coronaviruses, we were actually successful um, for, you know, the fact that we had so much lessons learned from prior research, we probably have had good success in developing mm -hmm. these vaccines now. Uh, but it's also because, to be quite honest, we were very lucky that coronaviruses seem to be easy targets. Sure. So if I were to predict, if we were to pick one family um, that we eventually can actually find some pan or universal um, broad ranging vaccine, it will be the coronaviruses. Um, because again, in there, uh, we, we are understanding a little bit better, you know, not only their, their structure, their epidemiology, and as long as we keep good surveillance and good understanding of the lineages and all the different families, I think it's, it's probably doable. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's sad that, in fact, we've been thinking about this for at least a decade. And in fact, in the, ourselves, we had proposed, you know, to, to investigate and develop a, a, a pan-beta coronavirus vaccine back in 2016. And we just, nobody had the appetite um, or the priority because, you know, they didn't really think coronaviruses were, were, were a priority at that time. And now we see that, that they are. In fact, we even had, you know, our recombinant protein SARS vaccine that was ready to go and be to be deployed into clinical evaluation, and 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 it was it never got any traction again back in 2016. Right. Um, and so now, but you know, again, you know, we should not complain. At least sure. a lot of the work that we did back in 2011, 2016, and uh, really enabled all of us to, you know, very quickly now deploy uh, you know, a, a vaccine that was successful um, because it, they're all targeting the same molecule, right? You know, give or take, it's spike, a piece of the spike, whether it's monomer as a particle, as a part of an inactivated virus, part of a vector, part of you know, a piece of RNA, ours is a recombinant protein. You know, we were very lucky that we, you know, we've been very successful. So I think that in the future, we'll, we hope to get, uh, a continued interest in developing, you know, pan or universal vaccines, um, certainly for coronaviruses, but mm -hmm. most likely also for others, right? Uh, but I think it's also the very interesting that because we now hear that even the general public has a much better appreciation of, of vaccines and even how vaccines are developed and that it's not an easy task, that we have a new era for vaccine development where even vaccines such as those that are really going to target diseases that only um, are found in a lot of poor people may get some attention. Um, they're not driven by market. They are a public, you know, they will be a public good. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. There's no money to be made out of these vaccines. Um, they will cost a lot of money to make and evaluate. But imagine a world where we can restore the health of, you know, the you know, bottom billion, right? Or, you know, at least the 1.2 billion people around the world that are poor, and we re, re incentivize them through a good health, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 life expectancy to then become much more um, productive in society, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, mm -hmm. you know, Children will learn better in school. Uh, children will grow with better cognitive capacity. Um, they will definitely have, you know, more uh, eagerness to um, get themselves uh, uh, integrated into the, you know, social and economic uh, um, different layers of this of, of 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 humanity. Right. Thank you for that message. Um, we're moving on to. <laughs> A related topic. So as, as I mentioned, I'm sitting here, uh, downtown center city, Philadelphia, a couple miles in any direction. Uh, I could, you know, uh, I, I could just go with the list. Barry Blumberg, hepatitis B, Paul Off at rotavirus, Dan Plotkin, rubella, Hillary Kapowski, and then rabies. The list goes on and on. I put you on that list, but you moved to Texas. Uh, but um, <laughs> the, 
vaccine hesitancy. I, you know, I, I watched a little uh, video you did for the American Association for Advancement of Science, countering science misinformation. How in 2021, obviously, I mean, I'm in a vaccine epicenter here, as you are. How did we get to this place with regard to this hesitancy for these amazing biologics that have given us so much health and longevity over the last couple of centuries? Uh, sure, but before I go into that, let me actually tell you a little bit about my experience in Philadelphia. And I okay. have to tell you that was my aha moment Good. Uh, because <laughs> of what you just mentioned, right? My aha moment was, you know, I was right finishing my second postdoc at Penn, right? Trying to figure out what would I want to be, in, you know, when I grow up. And believe it or not, I, as a little bit as a hobby, started going to Temple University and uh, I enrolled in a business administration program. Okay. But my aha moment was that many of my teachers and lecturers came from the pharmaceutical sector mm. because you have, you know, as, you know, not only you're surrounded by, right. you know, the, 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 all the medical institutions in Philly, but you are surrounded by a lot of these pharmaceutical companies, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's how I came about this concept of, you know, I'd really love to work in this, the business of science, right? Of managing big programs, advancing these, these global health technologies, albeit not in the for-profit sector because I don't work for a pharmaceutical company. I work right. in an academic environment, but learning, you know, at the end of the day, that way we design prototypes and we transfer those technologies to vaccine manufacturers and we do the trials you know, whether you're academic or you're, or you're a private pharmaceutical entity, you have to go by the same quality and the same requirements, right? You know, regulatory wise. Um, so it was an amazing experience for me. I have to say, I lived in Philly, um, you know, four or five years and I, mm -hmm. I, I still love it. And I still have a lot of uh, friends and um, my advisor, Rick Asoyan, is still there at Penn and sending him my regards if he's hearing this. But you're right. I mean, I think that uh, as with um, uh, not only how technology evolves and how we have certainly better tools to design better interventions, at some level, you know, having technologies of disseminating information, social media, you know, the, the Facebook, and now you have all sorts of, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, you know, Snapchat, um, you name it, you know, I don't even know how many, Twitter, um, it, it, it gave the opportunity that then you can put a lot of information, but people maybe don't take enough time to uh, investigate the source, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, when I studied back in the days, besides the fact that we were not even in the era of internet, we had to work with encyclopedias or things that were written, right? Written. Then, you know, slowly with the internet, you at least could get some things like that you could download. Um, uh, and now pretty much, you know, sometimes say it's like, you know, nobody even goes to libraries because you practically can basically just Google it, you know, Dr. Google, you know, it's, you know, or, you know, these things. And so I think that certainly has brought in you know, a lot of this misinformation, disinformation at all levels. But then there's a, also the fact that as with everything, and, you know, it can be in, not only in the area of politics, but also in the area of just, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, we all have our points of views and we all, you know, have our trustworthy um, outlets and who we hear and we trust. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's where uh, there's many groups that have taken advantage of the trust of the, of the people. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily is only those that are maybe you say, you know, of lower level of education. That is not true. In fact, a lot of this misinformation and disinformation occur even in the highly educated uh, mm -hmm. groups. Um, and, and I think it has, of course, exacerbated with you know, a lot of myths, right? You know, and trying to find excuses of why you don't trust, um, you know, you don't trust your government or you don't trust your, you know, your doctor or you don't trust, you know, so it's all trust. And I think that's why when, when I did my Leshner Fellowship, uh, first of all, it was really to uh, learn a little bit better because we scientists also sometimes we get trained in very, um, unique, sophisticated uh, 
topics and even terminologies and we forget that sometimes we need to be able to translate them in, 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 in for the general public. We have traditionally not been very good, I have to say, as scientists, translating that and going out and speaking to the general public. You know, I, I have to say I'm guilty, right? I always had a very hard time of explaining what exactly do I do. And sometimes some of my best friends are explain it better than I do because they really, you know, use language that, is not the scientific language. And I think that Leshner Fellowship allowed me to, you know, put a, a better context of how, understand your audience, understand what, you know, what you're trying to um, disseminate as an information. Why are you doing it, right? Um, who are you trying to reach out? But not with the purpose of debating or trying to convince. It's not a mm -hmm. convincing activity. It's really to, you know, tell my story, why do I believe in vaccines? Why for me, I think, you know, they're important. Why myself, I got vaccinated. Why my, you know, I, I try, I take care of my family and my community, but then also listen to their story and understand why some of them are hes hesitant. And it may sometimes be that they were just looking at the wrong place for information. And maybe they don't realize that that information is not coming from reputable sources or that they distort the truth, right? Because now what we're seeing is, you know, it's like when you, when we're talking and then you take a snippet of, of my recording and then you patch together to make me say something that at the end of the day, maybe wasn't putting the same in the, in the right context, right? So mm -hmm. there's many ways that, you know, this can happen. So I think it's very important that we scientists are normal human beings like anybody else and therefore when we go out into our communities we have to be more storytellers right and really um, understand and listen and be better listeners well you, you, you've done a very good job of explaining what you do on this show i have to tell you it's um it's it's been a really fascinating hour listening to your journey and everything you're doing and really wishing you and your team the best with all of this and, and everything you're doing for us. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh, on our podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi, Distinguished Professor of Biology, Associate Dean, National School of Tropical Medicine, and Professor in the Departments of Pediatrics, Molecular Virology and Microbiology, Integrative Molecular and Biomedical Sciences, and Translational Biology and Molecular Medicine, all at Baylor College of Medicine. Don't forget, she's also co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development, adjunct professor of the Department of Bioengineering at Rice University, and editor-in-chief, Current Tropical Medicine Reports. Maria, it was a really fascinating time listening to you. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to our audience. Thanks for everything you're doing down there to keep us healthy. And as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via all your initiatives. A really fascinating story. Thank you, Ira. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed this conversation with you.